Good morning. Welcome to God's house this Sunday morning as we gather together to worship and praise his holy name. Uh, there's one thing that I'll point out to you later on in the bulletin. It's hymn number 203, Lord, keep us steadfast in your word, not 293. I didn't catch that earlier, uh, but it was, uh, so I'll point that out as we sing our songs of praise. This is the fourth weekend in Lent. Let us begin our worship with the hymn 353 on the screen before you and in the, the red hymnal in front of you, if you like. Praise the one who breaks the darkness. We continue our worship of the one who breaks the darkness in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of that forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
us pray. Almighty God, we confess that we deserve to be punished for all our evil deeds. But we ask you graciously to cleanse us from all sin and, and to comfort us with your salvation. For your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. We turn our focus now to the Word of God, record it for us in our, in our Holy Scriptures. You can find the first two lessons on your, in your bulletin as well as on the screen before you. Our first lesson is from Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. This is the word of our Lord. We join our voices in singing Psalm 38. We'll sing it together in unison. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. Our second lesson from Scripture this morning is from Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. 
in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of our Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We respond with the verse... The gospel for this morning is John chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Filled the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw out, draw out some and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first. And then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This is the gospel of our Lord. Continue our worship with hymn number 391. God loved the world so that he gave.
portion of God's word for meditation is from our first lesson from Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. I'll just read a section of it for you as we meditate on his word. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord would take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. So far the words of our Lord. The grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, fellow redeemed children of God. How many of you have heard this story before about the bronze snake? Show of hands. Okay, so it's not unfamiliar. It's not the most familiar section of scripture, but it's not unfamiliar. And so so you've, you've heard about the bronze snake and, and kind of what happened in it. And so today we're going to look at that and ask why a little bit and, and, and even how. But the, what's going on isn't uncommon to the Israelites. So even if you haven't heard about the bronze snake specifically, it, it, but you've studied the Old Testament Israelites, you would know their MO. They would get frustrated with their current living situation, with not having what they once had in Egypt, not having some of the, the finer things, or even the, what they might have thought of as necessities, and they would complain. And usually when that happened, when they were already settled in Canaan, God would send a, a nation, a group of people, like the Philistines, or the, or the Amalekites, or the Amorites, you know, you pick anyites, they're there, and God would use them to discipline his people. And after a while of being disciplined, they would realize, wow, we haven't called on God in a while. And then they would call on God and and ask that God would deliver them, and he would send a judge and deliver them. Well, prior to them settling in Canaan, they would always just go to Moses and say, Moses, why'd you bring us out here? You know, they do that little, oh, that titter-tater thing. Why'd you bring us out here just to die in the desert? Don't you love us, God? And then they would complain, and, and God would provide water. <laughs> or, or, or he'd provide manna and quail. Or he'd make the water good enough to drink. Here's another one of those moments where they find themselves, after having been delivered by God in one way, it not being good enough. Our, our text really is, is after a section where they have had a deliverance by God. Uh, he has shown them victory in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 21 when the Canaanite king of Arad, who lived in the Negev, heard that Israel was coming along the road to Atherim. He attacked the Israelites and captured some of them. So they, they were under attack by an individual, and, and he captured some of them. Then Israel made this vow to the Lord. If you will deliver these people into our hands, we will totally destroy their cities. The Lord listened to Israel's plea and gave the Canaanites over to them. They completely destroyed them and their towns, so the place was named Horma. God had given them victory. He had delivered them after they had said, please, if you do this, we'll do that. That was in verse 3. Verse 4, the people grew impatient. (laughs) That's one verse. I'm not counting down the time. I don't know if it's One verse equals 40 years or 15 years or 15 days. But one verse later, on that same journey, the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses. So this time God doesn't send a nation. He does something that uh, I I find very interesting, almost like, why did you do that, God? He sent snakes, venomous snakes. So, so not, okay, so those of you that know me know I'm not a fan of snakes at all. Garter snakes, can't stand them. I jump when I see them. I know they're not poisonous, but I got issues. He sent venomous snakes. Ones that when they bite you, that's it. That, that you're, 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 de- you're dying because of that venom that's in there that's, that, that, that kills you. And it says, many of the Israelites died. 
I don't know how many. It doesn't tell us how many. Was it in the thousands? Was it the hundred thousands? Was it 500,000? But it was a lot of them, enough of them that they said, Moses, help us. And what they asked for from God is interesting. They say, we have sinned, pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So their prayer is that, that he would take the snakes away from them. And, and could God have done that? Could God have taken the snakes away from them? Yes. He could have sent a pack of mongoose, or mongai, mongoose to the area and had them wipe out all the snakes because they were the natural predator of, of, the, of the snakes. He could have done that. He didn't do that. He could have opened up the ground and had them swallowed up in some miraculous earthquake. He didn't do that. He could have sent a guy like, you know, St. Patrick over there to go build all the snakes. He didn't do that. He didn't take away the snakes, but he gave them a way out. He gave them a way to be victorious in that moment, a way to not die, a way to be saved. He gave them a way of salvation in that moment. So my first question that I have for you is, how far would you go to be saved? What would you do to be saved? What God told Moses to do sounds weird. Moses, I want you to fashion a bronze snake. Make a bronze snake. I'm thankful God didn't say, Moses, make a bronze camel. That might have taken longer. The bronze snake. Put on the pole. And when they look to that, then they will not die if they're bitten by the snake. Okay. How many people do you think still died because they said, that won't work? How many people do you think said, I don't, I don't get it. I, I don't think that's going to work, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to my home and put some balm and some salve on that wound, that bite, because I don't think that that, look at that broad snake, I looked up before, it didn't save me then. I don't want to go back to doing what I was doing before and, and keep on doing my same activity, because even though I know God told Moses, and then Moses did what God said, I don't trust. I wonder how many died. It doesn't tell us. But God had given them a way to be saved in that moment. It was the way he chose to do it. That, that bronze wasn't special. The snake wasn't special. The man who made the snake, well, he's most a prophet, but he was still a human being that was sinful. He wasn't that special. But what made that effective is that the word of God said, make that brown snake. If they do this, then they will live. It's God's word and his promise that that was going to be the case that gave them that victory in that moment, that gave them that salvation in that moment, that saved their lives. Not the snake itself, not the picture of a snake, not the bronze that was used, but that God's word said, do that. And so many of them did, and, and we hear at the end of our text, finally, then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. I asked the question, how far would you go? Because there are people who hear God's word, and his word is very clear about how it takes, what it takes for us to be saved. We read it earlier today. For it is by faith. Grace, you have been saved through faith, right? It, it, it's not what you do. But the text reminds me of another question. It was asked by a guy in, in Philippi. You know where Philippi, uh, Macedonia? Philippi, the place where, where Paul and Silas were, were beaten and whipped and thrown into prison unjustly, where, where the the earth, God caused an earthquake to happen and the jail doors opened and the, and the chains were loosened and Philippi and then the jailer who thought well I'm already I'm going to be dead because they're all escaped I'm going to kill myself and Paul says don't we're all here and I think the jailer was from, from Texas he said all y'all <laughs> and so he didn't kill himself but instead he asked Paul and Silas what must I do to be saved Say, I'm, I'm, I'm going back to the, the, the brown snake. How, how am I saved? 
What must I do? How far would you go to be saved? And the jailer was asking, right now, I, I would almost be thinking, you know what? Paul didn't say do something. He said, believe. Nothing you have to do. Believe. Christ did it all. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. How far would you go? There are people who will walk across hot coals in order to try to find salvation or, or heaven. There are people who will take umpteenth number of, of drugs and, you know, to, to try to find some kind of higher ground, higher plane. There are people who will hurt themselves trying to reach that euphoria that says, I'm doing better. Now, there are people who will climb any mountain and go over any kind of rugged terrain thinking that this is going to get me closer to God. And rather, it's within the church, and we call it your penance. Have you said the prayer right enough? Did you say it long enough? Are your knees hurt enough from the kneeling? Is your back hurt enough from the whipping? Ask Luther what that was like. How far would you go? And, and if, if, I, if I would say, I know a way that you could be saved, and they'd say, ha, ah, what do I have to do? And they would be willing to try and do that if they thought it would work. But when God says, for those people of Israel, look at the brown snake, and you'll live. God tells us not to look at a snake or any kind of item, but to look to him. The, the end of the story of the brown snake isn't in our text. It's later on in Kings where the people of God started to make that brown snake an idol. They brought it into their worship. They had it at their temple and we're told about it because Hezekiah, one of the last good kings of Israel, destroyed it along with the idols of Baal and Asheroth because people were using it as a way to, to talk about healing and being saved, and, and God didn't have it for that reason. And as much as I look at them and I kind of go, wow, what are they doing? I, I think we fall in that trap sometimes too. I remember when we were at Sim, we, we, were, we were kind of rigid. You know, you, you had Sim, you're kind of rigid with your thought and ideas. And there were a couple of lefties in the, in the, in the class, and they would end the, the day with a blessing, with a left handed blessing. We were like, oh, you can't left handed bless. Because we were so rigid. There are some people, when the, when the, when the sacraments are up, the elements are up here, if you don't bless the, the elements, then it's not really the bread or wine because the cross has to be right there because it's how you make it right. And, and there's a cross behind me that I, I see there. It's what to my right. All those windows have crosses. Thank you, Marla. But we don't worship the cross. We worship the one who hung on the cross who's no longer on the cross, the one who died for our sins, the one who shed his blood for us. We worship not the tomb, not an empty grave. We worship the one who was in the grave, who rose from the dead, so that we're connected with him and that we too shall rise. I was telling some of you last week, Wednesday, I had, I had the blessed privilege of baptizing three young uh, teenagers from Kingdom Prep. And so at their, at their Wednesday chapel, we did three baptisms, and, and it was awesome. And I told them the same thing I tell, I'll tell you now, that baptism, which, which we believe because the Bible says now saves, <laughs> that water, I went to the faucet, turned it on, hot and cold, so it wouldn't be too hot or too cold, and I brought it, and I brought it into the gymnasium in a bowl. That's the water I used. On Wednesday, if, in two weeks, not Wednesday, in Sunday in two weeks, we'll have a baptism of three babies from New Beginnings. That they're still part of what our ministry is, and I, I contact them once every two weeks, and, and there are three babies to be baptized. And I told those ladies the other day on the phone, it's just water. It's got the same script over for whatever that was that we had back in the 90s in Milwaukee. We had, the, we had the same water that you drink out of. I'm just going to go over to the fossil over here and get it and bring it here, put it in the bowl, and that's going to be the water. Nothing special about the water. I'm not going to bless the water. There's no special dance from here to there for the water. It's just water. These hands, nothing special about these hands. These are the same hands a year and two months ago that used to shake on the way out of church. But these are the same hands that, that, that are going to be pouring the water over that baby. Nothing special about these hands. 
<laughs> but you know what makes that moment miraculous? It's that word of God. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's what makes it powerful. Not, not the, the, the water or these hands or even the location, but, but the word of God. And the promise that comes with that word. In Numbers, the promise was, if you look to that snake that I told him to make it, you will live. That was the promise of God on that moment. When we go to the altar of Christ and we partake of the body and blood of the bread and wine, it's a miracle we receive forgiveness of sins and strengthen of our faith because that's what God promised. And we bring young and old to the baptismal font, to the river, to the lake, whatever body of water, whatever water you have, what makes it powerful is not the person performing it, nor the water itself, but the word of God that is attached to that, that promises you forgiveness of sin, salvation, and eternal life. That's what does it. And so all, for all the times when, when we ourselves get into the, it's, it's how we worship, it's, it's the pew we sit in, it's the, it's the hymn we sing, it's the, it's the book we use, it's, it's the translation we read from, and we get caught up in those things, in those forms, God forgive us. Let us not worship our worship. But let us worship the one who died for us, the one who loved us to create us and, and, and now calls us to live for him. And let us worship God, the perfecter of our faith. And so I leave you with the words that, that, that you know. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourself. It is a gift of God that no one can boast of. May God bless you as you look to him. Keep your faith in him. Always. Amen. At this time, join me in the confession of our Christian faith. We use the words of the Apostles' Creed. What is it that you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. During this time, we would normally, and I, I, I'm almost tired of saying normally, in the past we have gathered our offerings during this time, but now there's a, a uh, box in the backs to, to avoid the, some of the passing of, of germs and whatnot. But we would ask that you would still fill out the friendship register in your pew. And it, gives a, it gives us a record of your being here, which is the least important piece of it, but also helps us to know how we can serve you in the future. So if you have things you want us to pray for for you or a family member or a loved one, please put that there as well. And God bless your giving. We join our hearts in a prayer of thanksgiving for the offerings that we were able to and blessed to give back to our Lord.
In our prayers this morning, we'll keep those three young boys uh, in our prayers and, and try to lift them up through that prayer uh, as they continue to be taught the word of God. Uh, we look forward to those three young babies that will be coming in a couple of weeks to be baptized. And we pray for all those who can't be with us and can't join us in worship today. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessed gifts that you have given to us, the church, that you have given us the gift of faith in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, that you have given us the word that so clearly shows that in the spirit that works through that word so that we might know you as our Savior and our Lord and our God. Lord, we pray that you will continue to bless us and grow us in that faith, maturing it every day through your word and through sacraments. Lord, we thank you that you allow us to use these tools of the sacraments to bring people to you and to bring that word to them. Lord, be with Isaiah and John and Levi as they have confessed their faith, received the holy baptism, and are now growing in that faith. May the, the school, may the church, may we as Christians be there to support and encourage them in their, on their journey. Lord, we also thank you for those who will be baptized those three little babies from New Beginnings, Lord, that you be with them and you give them and their families that support and encouragement through New Beginnings, through Fairview and through the entire Christian church, that they know that they're supported always by a God who loves them and who has redeemed them. And Lord, for all those who can't be with us because they are sick or infirm or, or because of this current COVID climate that we're in, Lord, we pray that you be with them and let them know that no matter where they are, that you are, you are with them by your word, through your word, and in their hearts. Hear us, Lord, now as we bring to you our private petitions. Having heard us individually, Lord, come to you. Hear us as we join our voices together and pray the prayer that our Savior has taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We conclude with the responsive sending prayer found in your bulletin and on the screen. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another, serving the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Our final hymn for today is hymn number 203. 203. Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Hymn number 203.
Good morning. Thanks for joining us for worship. Uh, it was uh, a pleasure to have you with us. If you're a guest or visitor, thanks for coming with us. Water. Enjoy it. May God bless the rest of your day.